Okay, I'll accept that. What is our melting point or our boiling point? What's the whole, what's happening at that point? What's causing it? Why are we doing, how are we doing that phase change? What allows it to change from a solid to a liquid to a gas? It's heat. What is that heat breaking? The intermolecular forces, not bonds, unfortunately. Okay. We're doing our phase transitions. We maintain the exact same substance. When you boil water, we still have H2O. It's just H2O in the gas phase. We didn't break any bonds. What we broke were the forces. Okay. It's all about breaking your forces. What happens if you have stronger forces? You have weaker, or weaker bonds. You need more heat to rip those molecules away from each other. So to answer this question, we have to identify what type of intermolecular force is the strongest in each compound. To identify the strongest force, we also need to understand something about the bond. So what type of bond is present? Once we have the type of bond, we can extrapolate that out to the type of force. We can then compare forces between our molecules. Okay. I would argue that I put this up in complete reverse order as far as difficulty. I think four is easier than three, is easier than two, easier than one. Uh, so I kind of apologize for that. It's just the way it worked out. So let's look at it in reverse order. Let's take a look at four. What are the bonds that we see within that? Okay. Hydrogen and carbon is not a bond. hydrogen bond? And hydrogen bonding is not a bond. It's polar. Where I have my purple arrows between the oxygen and the hydrogen on one side and the oxygen and the carbon on the other, I have polar covalent bonds. When I look between the carbon and the hydrogen and the carbon and the carbon, I have polar covalent was already established between our oxygen and our carbon. We're going to end up with our nonpolar covalent bonds. Okay. What force do we get from nonpolar covalent bonds? Van der Waals. Van der Waals, or because that name I don't want to use, London dispersion. our London dispersion forces, our LDF. Polar covalent bonds re result in dipole-dipole forces. If we go through and shift to the other side of the molecule, what bonds do we have present there? Bonds, nonpolar non covalent bonds. Between the carbon and the oxygen, we have a polar covalent bond. And between the oxygen and the sodium, we have ionic. Translating down from our forces, our nonpolar covalent bonds generate LDF forces. LDF. Is it LDS? No. LDS is the, is the religion. <laughs> Sorry. LD, so it just Latter triggered Day something. Saints. I couldn't remember what it was going. Latter Day Saints. Okay. Sorry. Uh, neither here nor there. Polar covalent bonds generate dipole dipole forces. The ionic bond generates. Ionic forces. So when we go through to now decide which of these has the higher melting point, we need to look at each of these compounds and decide which is our strongest force. So when we look at the first compound, which is the stronger force, LDF or dipole-dipole? Dipole-dipole. So we can ignore the LDF. For the next compound, which is our strongest force? Ionic, which means we can ignore the dipole-dipole and the London dispersion forces. We can then compare ionic to dipole-dipole between the two molecules. Which one's the stronger force? Ionic, which means our answer then is B. We would use this exact same breakdown and split for every single one of these. Right? There's two that I would argue become a little bit more challenging, one and three. All right, so we're going to take a look at those two, and I'm going to assume you guys can figure out uh, question two kind of on your own based off this analysis. So let's take a look at three. When we look at three, we have nonpolar covalent, and we have polar covalent.
Between those, the nonpolar covalent gets us London dispersion forces, and our polar covalent gets us dipole dipole. We move to our other compound. Again, nonpolar covalent, more nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and polar covalent, right? This gets us LDF <coughs> and dipole dipole. When we now compare these two molecules, we have LDF and dipole dipole. Which one has the stronger force? Depends on the elements. What do you mean depends on the elements? Because certain elements have different forces. Certain, certain elements are going to generate different strength forces dependent on, you're right, what's going to determine the strength of that force? Size. Uh, partially, but we want to look at something else first. Electronegativity. Yes. How the atoms distribute their electrons. Okay, well, we're looking at carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and... Okay, so I like your thought. It didn't quite work out for us. Is there another difference here? Once we establish we have a dipole-dipole force, we should move on to decide, do we have the next level of our dipole-dipole force, which is? Hydrogen, hydrogen bonding. <laughs> For it to be hydrogen bonding, we have to have a dipole dipole. Both of those are the di both, both, uh, oh. <laughs> both of those have dipole dipole forces. So what we now need to do is say what's the extra thing to decide if we have hydrogen bonding? If it's connected to what's connected to hydrogen? Oh, if hydrogen, oxygen. fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. If we have a hydrogen directly attached to one of those three elements and we have established dipole-dipole, we have hydrogen bonding. Where are hydrogens connected in 3A? To, carbon. to carbons. There is no hydrogen connected to the oxygen, which means no hydrogen bonding. 3B. We look at the tail end of 3B. Where did it go? There it is. We have a hydrogen bound to oxygen, which means that dipole-dipole force is better represented as hydrogen bonding. Which is the stronger force, hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole? Hydrogen. hydrogen bonding, which means which compound has the higher melting point or boiling point? B. B. All right, we're two for two. Okay. Does that make sense? Questions about any of that? Breathe, breathe. Number one. <laughs> what happens in number one? Same. same types of bonds, which means same types of force, and that force comes out to be London dispersion forces. Okay. Both of them have London dispersion forces. Okay. So which one is going to have the higher melting point or boiling point? Okay. We could assume a trick question, and in that assumption, what are you, what's your answer going to be? You say they're both the same. They both have the same amount of force. And we could make that assumption initially. Okay. And this is actually why we call it London dispersion forces, because we look at the interaction and we say that jack interactions. There's nothing there. Okay, so it shouldn't be relevant. We don't need to worry about it. And yet, if we look at propane, propane is what phase? Gas. A gas. And the other compound, hexane, sorry, I guess I should have said that. 1A is propane. <laughs> 1B is hexane. Hexane is a liquid. If they both have the same forces, what should their phase be at room temperature? Gas. The same. They're not the same, so clearly... London dispersion forces have an effect. Something is somehow changing between these. If I just now told you that 1B is a liquid and 1A is a gas, which one has the higher melting or boiling point? B. B. Okay, so now the question becomes is why? Why would 1B have a stronger interaction or a stronger force than 1A? Because it is still London dispersion forces.
No, it doesn't quite work that way. If I take two quiz papers, these are not your quizzes, just so you know. Okay. And I bring them together, where do they interact? Where they're touching. It's on that surface, right? What happens if I ball them up and now bring them near each other? This is why they're not your quizzes. They could be. They have less surface. Now where are they going to interact? Still that exact same point where they touch. Which one has the stronger interaction? The first one, where they're flat. Why? There is more surface area contact. If we take a look at our comparisons, 1A to 1B, both of them are flat molecules. Okay? But one of them is a smaller piece of flat than the other one. 1B has a larger surface area, which means there are more London dispersion forces for that given molecule. And we end up seeing that compound have the higher melting point or boiling point. Okay. The reason I address this or bring this question up is not to be a jerk, though it is kind of jerky, okay. is to get you thinking about our melting points and boiling points and these physical properties. It is not just which has the strongest force. There are other contributing factors. One of those is that surface area. Okay. For the sake of this class, really all you need to be able to do, which has the strongest force, there's your answer. Okay. When asked for the highest melting point. Or boiling point. Kind of make sense? Okay. This is all going to come back to understanding your bonds and forces and their relationships. You need to be able to look at a structure, quickly identify the bonds. Once you have the bonds identified, be able to do some analysis about their forces. Based on looking at the forces, you can then interpret something about their physical properties. Be it phase transitions, vapor pressure, viscosity, all of those fun kind of things. The big ones that you will see on your final, phase transitions and vapor pressure are the two big ones. Hi. Okay. Uh, and actually solubility. Solubility is a really big one. Okay. How many people have actually downloaded the practice final? Okay. That's about half the class. It's a little bit behind the curve right now. Okay. If you go through and take a look at that practice final, I have no idea why, but there's like five or six questions on this topic. That makes up roughly 10% of your grade based on interpreting intermolecular forces and how it applies to the different phases and temperatures and all that fun stuff. Okay. I do find this a bit bizarre because it takes up virtually no space within our textbook, and as far as I can tell from other classes, virtually no one talks about it. Okay. It's all coming back to an interpretations of bonds and forces and how those things translate into structure. Yes? Do you have the answers for the questions? Even if I didn't have the answers, shouldn't I have the answers? Well, yeah, but I mean, like... Are you going to share those answers with us? He wrote it. He's not a teacher, after all. You would hope I knew the answers. Yes, I do he have the answers. Have so Just like with every other exam, will I give you the answers? No. No. Okay. However, if you complete it and go through and say, hey, these are my answers, okay, I will go through and be like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Okay. And as long as we're looking at a reasonable amount of wrong answers, I know it's 68 questions, okay, I will individually line item each one and say, this is probably what you weren't thinking about, or this is what you weren't thinking about. Okay. If it hits like 20 or more, that are wrong, I can't line item it through an email. You need to sit down and talk with me, and I'll be happy to go through. And we can talk through why you're getting the answers wrong. Okay. One of the things that I will ask to see will be your work. Okay. If you don't have any work, the very first thing I'm going to ask you to do is show some work. Okay. Yes? How long do we have to take the final? You have uh, 110 minutes, an hour and 50 minutes. When is the final? Are you Shut up. May 10th? Oh, yeah. Cool. Thanks. I don't know. May 10th. I think it's Tuesday. Like what time? Because time? No. It is officially scheduled. Um, I think it's officially at this time. I think it runs from 1 to 2.50. I'm not positive on that. You should check the syllabus. It's on the syllabus. What? Okay. Other questions about that final? Other questions about the final? 
So for those of you wondering also about the final, it is kind of a standardized test. They made up one version, okay? well, multiple versions. All faculty end up using the same versions. Okay? We get to choose which version we want to use, but they're all pretty much the same thing. Uh, the people that wrote these standardized tests are also the same people that wrote the practice final. So doing the practice final is, in general, a good idea because you get the same kind of concepts translating across. Okay? In the same context that you get the same kind of questions from our practice final or practice exams to the actual exams. Okay? You don't get a one-for-one -one exact same question. You get similar types of questions. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Uh, let's see. I don't remember. Uh, I don't want phase transitions yet. Uh, actually, what's after that? Yeah, I do. Phase transitions, just a little fun thing to mention here. Fun, I know you all agree with that statement. We look at a graph, and I'm going to plot temperature on the y-axis and heat on the x-axis. So if I take ice at, say, negative 40 degrees, okay, where do you think I would be on this curve? Where's negative 40 degrees? Okay, we need to put in numbers, but where? Below it. Really, really low, right? Okay, so let's put it down here. That's our negative 40 degrees. Okay. What happens as I add heat? Temperature increases, Temperature increases right? Okay. As I continue to add heat, it'll continue to rise until what happens? Um, it melts. And what happens when it melts? Does the temperature increase as it's melting? No, it actually doesn't. It flatlines. What happens if we add more heat? It continues to melt. Okay. So we will see a flat line. That flat line will occur at our melting point. If this was water, that or H2O, that point would be <clears throat> zero degrees Celsius. Remember, negative 40, slowly warming up. We're at solid ice. Okay. Once it all melts, what happens as I continue to add the heat? Then it increases. Increases the temperature increases. Okay. Then what happens? It flatlines again, and it flatlines where? 100 degrees Celsius. At 100 degrees Celsius, which happens to be the boiling point. So I have to continue to add heat to get my substance to go from a solid to a liquid and to get my substance to go from a liquid to a gas. Heat has to be added to force that. Okay? This is why we can use boiling water to cook things. Because as soon as we hit 100 degrees Celsius, if it all instantly turned into a gas, we're not going to have any hot water, right? It goes liquid, poof, gas. Doesn't quite work. Okay. That would actually be very, very scary. Okay. Uh, and that theoretically can happen, sort of. What happens as we continue to add heat? It's actually going to continue to go up. Okay. This is why steam can be an exceptionally dangerous substance. Because what is the temperature of gaseous water? It could be in a massive range. It could be 100 degrees Celsius, in which case that's probably going to burn you. Okay? Or it could be 150, 200 degrees, in which case it's going to melt your face. Okay? <laughs> so steam is an exceptionally dangerous material. Okay? So if we're looking at our heat process, what is happening in each of those flat lines? What, we are providing the energy for a phase change. Okay? That lower phase change is our phase change for, that's really not showing up. For what? Solid to liquid. Solid to liquid. So we're looking at the heat necessary to okay. melt. So we could represent that as an H melt. Okay, heat to melt. What about the next one? Heat to go from a liquid to a gas. Boil could work. Boil is not very fancy sounding. Typically, you hear V 
vaporization. And what we've now done is actually brought in some way to quantify each of these cases. We have a heat necessary to cause the phase change, and then we also have the heat involved in changing the temperature. This is the heat for a change in temp. Okay. Could we go through and quantify this a lot more? Yes, for the sake of this class and for my sanity, no, we'll just go ahead and move on. Okay. But what I want you to be aware of is what a heat versus temperature curve looks like and how to kind of roughly interpret information off of it. Okay. Kind of make sense? Okay. The other big one, solubility. Okay. Um, how do we predict whether two species should mix with another? Right. Number one, in theory, you've heard of a rule potentially about this. Anybody heard of a rule for solubility? And shout it out. Solubility rule. Oh, fair enough. I didn't consider that one. That was kind of dumb, <laughs> <laughs> admittedly, on my part. Right. Uh, yes, we have our solubility rules. So we could look up those solubility rules to go through and predict. Right. But what if we take a compound, say, like water, and the next one here, ethanol? Are we going to be able to find that in our solubility rules? Our solubility rules, we're looking at the solubilities of salt compounds or ionic compounds, metals and nonmetals. Not a metal, not a nonmetal. We run into an issue there. Okay? So we can't use our solubility rules to predict these. Is there another quote unquote rule that you could potentially think of that you've heard of somewhere else? We can go through and evaluate what it's bonded to and all of that, all that, and officially our rule of thumb is up there. Okay? No one's heard of like dissolves like. Really? Nobody? Like dissolves like. Like dissolves like? No. no. Okay, well then, never mind. You hadn't heard of that rule. That's our rule of thumb. <laughs> like dissolves like. I personally dislike this rule because it's not specifying what is the like. Like what dissolves like what? Like, <laughs> I would attempt a, a, a valley girl interpretation, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. L-I-K-E. Okay. Has it shown up there? Like dissolves like. Is that what you're trying to say? Like dissolves like, you know? I don't think that's helping, guys. I appreciate the attempt, but I don't think that's helping. Like forces dissolves like forces, right in the middle there. Okay. So the standard rule for it is like dissolves like. This is where, for lack of a better word, like to bring in forces as a term. Another way we can evaluate this without that horrible word is similar forces dissolve similar forces. If we have the same type of forces in the compounds, they will mix with each other. If we have different forces, they will not mix. Well, why won't they mix? Because they're different. They're different, okay? Keep it as simple as you can. So let's take a look at water and ethanol. Okay. Number one, anybody know the solubility of water and ethanol? I'm going to take a guess that most of you actually know that. Just experience telling me that. We'll evaluate some of that in a second. We want to look at the prediction behind this. We want to look at our forces. What forces does water have? With polar covalent bonds, we would end up with dipole-dipole. The dipole-dipole would be better classified as hydrogen bonding because we have a hydrogen bound to the oxygen. So we have hydrogen bonding as our strong force within water. When we go through and look at our ethanol, what do we have between carbon and hydrogen? A nonpolar bond, which generates a London dispersion force. What do we have between carbon and carbon? A nonpolar covalent bond. What do we have between carbon and oxygen? A polar covalent bond. And between oxygen and hydrogen? 
also polar covalent, which is going to lead us to dipole-dipole forces. Someone getting directions? Dipole-dipole okay, force. As we further evaluate that, what do we find? There is hydrogen bonding because we have the OH at the end. Is hydrogen bonding similar to hydrogen bonding? Yes, it is. And what ends up happening? They mix, which you again might notice after you take the final that water and ethanol mix very well. What are you trying to say? Ethanol, alcohol, beer, spirits, wine. Oh, I get it. Sparkling water. <laughs> <laughs> Sparkling water. I need to drink water. Some of us are underage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's take a look. The next compound. Would we expect those two to mix with each other? No. Why not? No hydrogen bonding. Water has hydrogen bonding as our force, and what do we expect out of our propane? Our LDF forces, not dipole-dipole, because carbon-hydrogen, carbon-hydrogen, carbon-hydrogen. No Those are all nonpolar covalent bonds. We'd expect London dispersion forces. Is London dispersion similar to hydrogen bonding? No. Right? So we do not expect those to mix. And sure enough, if we mixed uh, a nonpolar London dispersion force molecule with water, we get two phases like water and oil. So we can predict those solubility patterns by just evaluating something about their bond characteristics and translating that into forces. Kind of a neat process. You want a trickier question? That was a rhetorical question. Sorry, your no is going to be ignored. Okay, what happens if we take water with this next compound, go away. <laughs> Touche, that was nice. Would I expect water and whatever that compound is. Yeah. Uh, non all to mix. You don't need to know how to name that. I feel like non all is really. Today's Tuesday. What does that have to do with Exactly. <laughs> Would we expect those two to mix? Yes. yes. Why? They both have hydrogen money. We go to mix these, and what do we end up finding? <laughs> they don't mix. Okay, why not? Too much of the London dispersion force coming from the other molecule. Okay, so that brings up the next question. What is too much? I don't know. Too much is whatever causes them to not mix. That's too much. Okay. And I'm sure you love that answer because that means you have to experimentally dissolve it or discover it. Okay. And that's really how you would go through and figure it out. Okay. For the sake of this class, we tend to do very simple comparisons where we don't bring in something as complicated as this. Okay. That was just a quick test to get you a feel for what's going on with it. Okay. Science is not a perfect science all the way through. We come up with the best comparisons we can, and we hope for the best. Next one, the bottom. What do we expect for ionic compounds? Water has what force? Hydrogen. Sodium chloride has what force? Uh, ionic. Are those forces similar? Yeah. Okay. Why not? Let's say I have, uh, I don't know, an orange hydrogen bonding interaction which is roughly halfway between ionic and hydrogen bonding. Which one is it closer to? Well, if I picked it exactly halfway in between, how do we know? 
We don't. So how do we discover what's going on with our ionic compounds? Remember at the beginning of this slide, I actually asked you, what information do you know about solubility already? Water is a universal solvent. Water is a universal solvent, yes. But what did it have to do with our solubility rules? Dang it. Solubility rules. Solubility rules. You have solubility rules. How do we predict our ionic compound solubility in water? You use solubility rules. Okay. As a soft rule of thumb, if it is an ionic compound, it is very typically soluble in water. Right. Which seems a bit odd, because if we look at those forces, are they similar? No. no. So why does water dissolve salt? It is polarity, and the more polar they both are, the more equal polarity, the more likely they would mix. But it's ionic versus hydrogen bonding. Rule one. We could be kind of annoying and go back to our rule one. That's fair enough. If we went through and looked at, ignore those hydrogen bonding terms, dissolving salt in water. What happens to salt when it dissolves in water? What does it become? Salt. Come on now. <laughs> Na plus and Cl minus. Which of those two ions would I expect to fit in the middle there? Salt. God, they had to draw that water molecule all sorts of weird, didn't they? Sodium. Uh, let's draw. Sorry, I had to change the figure. What do we expect for that middle ion now? Sodium. Why sodium? Say that again a little bit louder. Hydrogen's a negative charge? Is it partially? Partially. Oh. Partially negative? How do we decide our partial charges? Electronegativity. Electronegativity. Which one is more electronegative, oxygen or hydrogen? Electron. The most electronegative el most element on the periodic table is? Hydrogen. Fluorine. Which is closer to fluorine, oxygen or hydrogen? Oxygen. Oxygen, which means oxygen steals the electrons, and it becomes negative by gaining electrons. The hydrogen, because it's now lost electrons, becomes positive. So the atom that should go in the middle should be the chlorine to best interact with the positive hydrogens. Okay. And why I liked your answer, even though you were wrong, is that you committed and made the statement. Okay? And that is the biggest issue I'm looking at. When I look through your exams, I'm noticing a lot of blank pages. And you're like, well, it's multiple choice. I don't need to show my work. You're right. You don't need to show your work. And the average is showing that, that you're wrong. Because the average is in the 60% range. How is it working for you to not show your work? Not very well. Try writing it down. Even saying it out loud is enough to get you to think and go, wait, did I really just say that? Is, that? is that actually true? The instant you keep it in your head and avoid looking at that answer is the instant you get the answer wrong. Write it down. I would say say it out loud, but then it's going to be a really loud exam. Okay, so we can't do that. So write it down. Okay. So, we're looking to balance out our charges. Why does water dissolve salt compounds? Because it's not a single water molecule interacting with a single salt. It is several water molecules interacting. Each of those interactions between water and that ion of chloride is a weaker interaction than the interaction between chloride and sodium. However, there are more water interactions when it's dissolved than when salt is not dissolved.
The sum total of the forces stabilize better in the liquid dissolved state than they do in the solid state. That's why it ends up dissolving. So again, it's not just as straightforward as like dissolves like. You have to evaluate some other conditions that come into it, which makes it trickier. What happens to the sodium? Good question. What's the other end of your water molecule? The oxygen. What charge is that oxygen? The oxygen is negatively charged. We could put the sodium ion around a sphere of oxygens. And that's my lazy water molecule. Close enough. Kind of make sense? So when we're going through and thinking about our solubilities, that's one of our processes. Okay? So... <clears throat> Moving from the solid to the liquid, what we're doing is breaking those intermolecular forces. So to get solid sodium chloride to dissolve, what things might we need to do? Sodium here, chloride over here. What things could we do to help that process along? Provide heat. Why would heat help us move from solid sodium chloride to dissolve, so, so, bleh, dissolve sodium chloride? It's a phase change on going from a solid to a liquid. How do we change from a solid to a liquid? You add heat. What happens when we add heat? We break the intermolecular forces. As soon as we loosen those intermolecular forces, what can then happen? water can swoop in and provide a secondary interaction that ends up giving us our stronger force. So when we're trying to dissolve solids, typically what we notice is that as we add heat, we increase solubility. Does that make sense? All right, let's see how well you really got a hold of that one. Next quiz. What phase is CO2? No, it won't be a quiz. CO2 is a gas, and when we dissolve the gas, it does not break it up, unfortunately, like our sodium chloride. Why does it not break it up? What is different about CO2 versus sodium chloride? Don't tell me the phase. It's the bond. It's the type of bond. Sodium chloride is an ionic bond. Carbon dioxide is polar covalent. Different bond type, we're going to get a different type of interaction when we break that apart, okay, or when we dissolve it. What would we expect to happen now? What do I want to do with the temperature to get the CO2 to dissolve in the water? You cool it. Okay. There's our two answers. We add heat or we cool it. Okay. To dissolve sodium chloride in water, we added heat. That improved its solubility. That's because I'm going from a solid to a liquid. What's happening now? I'm taking a gas to a liquid. What happens when I add heat to a gas? It becomes gassier. It becomes more gassy. <laughs> well, that didn't work. What am I trying to do? I want it to go the other direction. I want it to go into the liquid phase. So to get a gas to dissolve in a liquid, I actually want to cool it down. That will help it reduce its mobility and stay in the liquid form. Okay? Questions about that? There's another condition that we could potentially bring in now, but we'll wait until we talk about gases. Okay. So now the fun part, because I believe all of you have already done this lab, the titration lab. You guys did that last week. I do apologize for this. It never shows up in correlation with the lecture. So sorry you had a rough time with dealing with those conversion factors. Okay. What happens when we now take a solution where we've taken a salt and we dissolve it in water? Okay. And now we take a second solution and we mix those two. If we mix those two and we see a solid form, we've got a chemical reaction. If that chemical reaction is producing something I want to isolate, I want to know how successful I was at making that product. Okay. To go through and answer that question, we go back to doing our limiting reagent calculations and our percent yield. Okay. Don't scream too much already. We aren't going to go that far into it. Okay. What type of reaction occurs. We have a double replacement reaction happening up here, so that's going to be an important characteristic to evaluate. 
to help us decide what's happening between the limiting reactant, we need to balance that equation. And then we can use the coefficients from our balanced equation to convert, say, aluminum bromide into silver bromide, right? Okay. When we did this before, how did we measure the aluminum bromide, the silver nitrate, and our silver bromide? In moles. Okay, that was the simple example. We made it one more step difficult by doing... When you go into lab, do you measure moles? You measure grams. So we went all the way back and said, okay, you're doing it with grams now. So we measure out the gram amount of this, which then means we convert it to the mole amount of this, and then we can do this converted into moles of that, then we can do the grams of that using its molar mass, all those fun conversions, right? Vaguely ring a bell. That's about all I need out of this. Okay. And yeah, you may have hated that, but you're responsible for it. What happens now when we take a look at our solutions? When you go into lab and measure out the aluminum bromide, what phase is it? What phase is it? AQ is not liquid. It's aqueous. How would you measure out that aqueous solution? Okay, we would more than likely measure it in liters. Okay, but we started our whole calculations off with grams. Okay, well, can we still measure a mass for a liquid? Yeah, okay, so let's avoid the liter solution. You're going to dodge liters by measuring out the mass of your aluminum bromide aqueous solution. Okay, and you get a 10 gram amount. Okay. Of that 10 grams, how much of it is aluminum bromide? Okay, I'm saying some people shake their heads at me. Why are you shaking your heads? Because you have no clue? Or you're saying there's something missing? Something's missing? Okay, I agree with that. What's that something missing? What is that 10 grams of? Both of what together? Yes. Aluminum bromide, yeah. And water. How much of that 10 grams is water? Depends on how concentrated a solution you made. Okay. There's another conversion factor that needs to come into this. The conversion factor that relates the volume of liquid we're working with and the amount of aluminum bromide that is present in that sample. Okay. There are a variety of ways that we could go through and quantify this. One way, we could say, well, in that 10 gram sample, okay, I took five grams of aluminum bromide and I dissolved it in one liter of water. How can I determine the amount of aluminum bromide present? Actually, let's do this. One liter of solution. This is 10 grams of solution. Are our units going to match? No, we got a problem here. So instead of taking the mass of the solution, maybe we should... Let's get the volume. Okay, that should simplify it. Let's be really nice and say 10 liters of solution. You didn't do that. That's really big. Let's just work with it. Okay. Can I figure out how many grams of aluminum bromide are in that solution now? If you know how much water you have I want to know the grams of aluminum bromide. What was I given to begin with? 10 liters of solution. Are liters of solution the same thing as grams of aluminum bromide? What do we need? Conversion a conversion factor. And that conversion factor should get rid of liters of solution. And what do we want on top? Glam. <laughs> you guys are making fun of me way too fast. You give me a second to breathe. Do we have a conversion factor between grams and liters? Five grams to one liter. Five grams. One liter. Okay. By knowing something of the concentration of our sample, we can now determine how much of that sample is the actual reactive species. So we now have, yet again, a new conversion factor. Okay. When we think back to the conversions where we looked at grams, what was the very first thing we converted that gram amount to? Moles. Moles. 
So I could go through and report all of my concentrations as a gram per liter. But then what am I going to do? I'm going to convert into grams, and then the very next step would be after I've converted it to grams, convert it into moles. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of reporting it as grams in my solution, I started with a different unit, say like moles? If I go through and do that, I end up shortcutting one of my steps. So one of the ways that we can quantify our concentration is report it as the number of moles of our substance okay, in liters of our solution. How would we calculate this? Well, figure out the moles in your solution and divide it by the volume of the solution, moles over liters. And there it is. That's how we calculate it. For some unknown reason to me, instead of just going through and saying it's moles over liters, we decided to invent a new unit and call this relationship of moles and liters something else. What do we call it? Molarity. Molarity. Okay. Not only do we decide to give it a new name, but we invent another unit to represent it. We use capital M. Okay. Why do we use capital M? Okay. Chemists are inherently lazy. If I ask you to prepare a 5 mole per liter solution versus a 5 molar solution, I saved myself a half a second by saying molar instead of mole per liter. It is that half a second that caused us to invent this new unit of a capital M. Right, which means when you see capital M, you should immediately convert it into our standard conversion format, moles over liters. Put your numeral or your number out in front of the moles. What number shows up in front of liters? One. If it is any other number, the five changes. We now have a conversion factor that allows us to relate volume and the number of particles in our sample for any individual substance. Yippee ki yay. All right. So, what is the molarity of a solution containing 24 grams of sodium hydroxide and 0.1 liters of solution? I'll go through and work this one with you guys. To get molarity, molarity we said immediately was moles over liter. So my answer needs to be whoops, units of moles over liters. I should get a little bit more specific here. It's not just moles over liters. It is moles of, NaOH. Moles of sodium hydroxide okay, over liters of solution. solution. Okay. Am I given either moles or liters to start? Hey, I'm given liters to start. So let's go ahead and use that value first in my solve. Okay? So I'm going to put that in. Where do I want to put that number into my equation to solve? In the denominator. Okay? So what do I want? Oops. Come back to that in a second. What is it? 0 0.100 liters of solution needs to show up in the denominator because that's where it shows up in the answer. It shows up in the denominator. What number needs to show up on top of that? One. Okay. We're not given 0.1 liters of solution with respect to moles. We're just told it's 0.1 liters of solution. If I put in any other unit, it's no longer that value. If I put in any other number, it's no longer that number. So it needs to be a 1 on top. Okay. This gets me the bottom half of my calculation. Okay. Ideally, what would I want to multiply this by? The moles of sodium hydroxide and what in the denominator? 1. If it's any number other than one, it's no longer moles of sodium hydro that, that mole of sodium hydroxide. If it's any other unit, it's no longer moles of sodium hydroxide. 
Am I given the moles of sodium hydroxide? No. no. So unfortunately, I can't start with that. What was that? Okay, I am given 24.0 grams of sodium hydroxide. What's in the denominator? One. Okay, there's no conversion factor there. There's no other number. It needs to be one. Okay. Can I get rid of the grams? Well, number one, do I have to get rid of the grams? Yes. Yeah, it doesn't show up in the answer. So I need grams of sodium hydroxide on the bottom. And what needs to show up on top? The moles of sodium hydroxide. Is that conversion factor given to me in the question? In the question? No. 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 Where is it given to you? Periodic. On the periodic table. So you can do your math from the periodic table. Sodium has 23 grams per mole. Oxygen is 16 grams per mole. Hydrogen is 1 gram per mole. We all add that all up. Thank you for confirming. 40 grams per mole. The 40 shows up in front of? Grams. grams. Where does grams show up in our conversion factor? The 40 shows up there. What shows up in front of moles? One. One. Now I can punch it into my calculator and I, get, and I can get my answer. Can you simplify and scrunch some of these calculations next to each other? That is entirely up to you. You're now cutting steps out. I think it is easier to mistake those steps if you smash them together. If you write it out in this fashion, there's no smashing. Everything matches out exactly as it should be. Okay. Questions about that? Okay, your turn. <coughs> the way through it. To go through and set this up, we've got three conversions, so we do have a couple steps that we got to crunch out within this. The very first thing that I told you to go through and do right before we even got to this slide is the instant you see the capital M, you need to make it moles over liters. Okay, and so I will admit I am slightly disappointed in that because I noticed a lot of people wrote capital M. It's not capital M. That is a useless unit to write down. It is moles over liters. What number shows up in front of liters? What number shows up in front of moles? 0.15. Okay. <clears throat> Looking at our equation, ideally we would go get rid of milliliters, so those need to show up on the bottom. And ideally we would jump immediately to grams of our potassium dichromate. Okay, but we can't. Okay? So we would undo our gram part. What can we convert milliliters to? Okay. Really, milliliters don't show up anywhere in our question, so we need to get the milliliters into a unit that shows up somewhere else. Liters shows up. So we can do liters of solution. Okay? This goes all the way back to whatever that first chap second chapter was, looking at our metric unit conversions. Okay? 10 to the negative third is what milli means. And we've got our conversion factor. Right, for those of you that divided by 1,000, that's the same thing. It's OK. Yeah, it's <laughs> what? Because I just put 1,000, that's why. So uh, if you put the 1,000 on top, it's a problem. No, it's on the bottom. Yeah, if you put the 1,000 on the bottom, it's the exact same thing as this. Okay. okay. What unit are we now in? Liters. liters of solution. Do we want liters of solution in our answer? Yeah. So what has to happen? It needs to cancel. What can I convert liters of solution to? Again, ideally, grams of potassium dichromate. I don't have that conversion factor. The conversion factor I do have is moles of potassium dichromate. What number shows up in front of moles? 0 0.150 over 1 liter. Is moles my answer? No. Nope. So I put moles of potassium dichromate on the bottom, and I put grams of potassium dichromate on top. Where do I find the conversion factor between grams and moles of a substance? The periodic table. Some of that work is shown in the lower left-hand corner. I'm kind of assuming it was done correctly. I now have, for an answer, grams of potassium dichromate. It's just a question of entering it into the calculator, and I have my final answer. Questions about that? All molarity is is one extra conversion factor. Okay. 
you might actually like molarity a little bit better because it's a conversion factor that's given to you in the question. Molar mass, not given to you in the question, you're expected to look it up. Okay? Mole, mole conversions, not given you to you directly in the question. It's something that you have to do by finding it in a balanced equation. Okay? So molarity is a little bit more straightforward than some of the other conversion factors we've been looking at because it's something directly given to you. You just have to make sure that you interpret and get rid of that stupid capital M and turn it into a moles over liter. That sets up your conversion factor and allows you to go through and do the problem. Okay? Applications to molarity. Okay? You gotta love the small font here, right? Yeah. A chemist needs to determine the concentration of a solution of nitric acid. She puts 745 milliliters of the acid into a flask with an indicator. She then slowly adds 0.2 molar barium hydroxide to the flask until the solution changes color, indicating the equivalence point. She notes that 165 milliliters of barium hydroxide was needed to reach this point. What was the molarity of the nitric acid? This question sound familiar? This is the exact lab that you did last week. The only thing that's changed is the chemicals. Okay. So the calculations that you went through and did for lab that is due, actually you probably turned it in last week. No. Oh, some of you didn't turn it in last week. Some of you did. Okay. Um, these are the calculations that you would go through and do. To set this up, what do you need? You need to know what type of reaction was involved. Provide the balanced equation. What's your given information? Provide that information under, and you can set up and follow through with this. So it's kind of a quick walkthrough on this. Well, we only got two minutes, so it's going to, by definition, going to be quick. Let's see. Did I cheat? Oh, man. No, I didn't cheat. What is our equation? What did we react? I appreciate the shouting it all out at once. That was really good. Nitric acid plus... Thank you. Appreciate the support. Barium hydroxide to produce barium nitrate and HOH. Is HOH balanced? Yes, the phase would be a liquid. Is barium nitrate balanced? No, we need two, bar or two nitrates. Phase on that. Ooh. Oh, no, I know that one. You should know that one, too. I told you to memorize that rule. Aqueous, because nitrates. Anything with a nitrate is soluble. Okay. Now that we've got our equation, we need to make sure it's balanced. Is it balanced? Is it balanced? Now, hopefully it is. I think I got it balanced. Once we have the balanced equation, we can then start to skip steps by dropping information in that we know about each of those substances. Okay. Uh, we put 745 milliliters of the acid into the flask. We added 0 0.200 molar of our barium hydroxide. We added 165 milliliters of that solution to it okay, to reach the equivalence point. What does it mean at the equivalence point? End point. Yes, it is the end point, but what does that mean? Actually, we've got to be a little bit careful with that. The hydroxide equals H plus. Okay. Because those were the species that went through and reacted. Now that we've got a general idea of what's happening, what we're trying to solve for, the moles of our nitric acid over the liters of our nitric acid, are we given either of those values? Sort of. 
We're given 745 milliliters, which we can convert to liters. Are we given the moles of nitric acid? No, but we are given the ability to convert it by looking at our barium hydroxide. We'll pick up there, because sorry, I've talked a little too long. On Thursday, I'll finish out the rest of that calculation, and then we'll move on.